I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream by Harlan Ellison, 1967. Limp, the body of gore is hung from the pink pallet, unsupported, hanging high above us in the computer chamber, and it did not shiver in the chill, oily breeze that blew eternally through the main cavern. The body hung head down, attached to the underside of the pallet by the sole of its right foot. It had been drained of blood through a precise incision made from ear to ear under the lantern jaw. There was no blood on the reflective surface of the metal floor. When Gorisar joined our group and looked up at himself, it was already too late for us to realize that, once again, Am had duped us, and had its fun. It had been a diversion on the part of the machine. Three of us had vomited, turning away from one another in a reflex as ancient as the nausea that had produced it. Gorisar went white. It was almost as though he had seen a voodoo icon, and was afraid of the future. Oh, God, he mumbled and walked away. The three of us followed him after a time and found him sitting with his back to one of the smaller, chittering banks, his head in his hands. Ellen knelt down beside him and stroked his hair. He didn't move, but his voice came out of his covered face quite clearly. Why doesn't it just do us in and get it over with? Christ, I don't know how much longer I can take this. It was our 109th year in the computer. He was speaking for all of us. Nimdok, which was the name the machine had forced him to use because Am amused itself with strange sounds, was hallucinating that there were canned goods in the ice caverns. Gorister and I were very dubious. It's in their shuck, I told him, like the goddamn frozen elephant Am sold us. Then he almost went out of his mind over that one. We'll hike all that way and it'll be putrefied or some damn thing. I say forget it. Stay here. It'll have to come up with something pretty soon or we'll die. Then he shrugged. Three days it had been since we'd last eaten. Worms. Thick. And ropey. Nimdok was no more certain. He knew there was a chance, but he was getting thin. He couldn't be any worse there than here. Colder, but that didn't matter much. Hot, cold, hail, lava, boils, or locust never mattered. The machine masturbated, and we had to take it or die. Ellen decided for us. I've got to have something, Ted. Maybe there'll be some Bartlett pears or peaches. Please, Ted, let's try it. I gave in easily. What the hell? Mattered not at all. Ellen was grateful, though. She took me twice out of turn. Even that had ceased to matter, and she never came, so why bother? but the machine giggled every time we did it. Loud up there, back there, all around us, he snickered. It snickered. Most of the time, I thought of Am as it, without a soul. But the rest of the time, I thought of it as him, in the masculine, the paternal, the patriarchal, for he is a jealous people. Him, it, God as daddy the deranged. We left on a Thursday. The machine always kept us up to date on the date. The passage of time was important, not to us, sure as hell, but to him, it. Am. Thursday. Thank you. Nimdok and Gorister carried Ellen for a while, their hands locked to their own and each other's wrists a seat. Benny and I walked before and after just to make sure that, if anything happened, it would catch one of us, and at least Ellen would be safe. Fat chance, safe. It didn't matter. It was only a hundred miles or so to the ice caverns, and that second day, when we were lying out under the blistering sun thing he had materialized, he set down some manna. It tasted like boiled boar urine, and we ate it. On the third day, we passed through a valley of obsolescence filled with rusting carcasses of ancient computer banks. Am had been as ruthless with his own life as with ours. It was a mark of his personality. It strove for perfection. Whether it was a matter of killing off unproductive elements of his own world-filling bulk, or perfecting methods for torturing us, Am was as thorough as those who had invented him, now long since gone to dust, could ever have hoped. There was light filtering down from above, and we realized that we must be very near the surface. We didn't try to crawl up to sea. There was virtually nothing out there, had been nothing that could be considered anything for over a hundred years. Only the blasted skin of what had once been the home of billions, and now there were only five of us, down here inside, alone with Am. I heard Ellen saying frantically, No, Benny, don't, come on, Benny, don't, please. And I realized I had been hearing Benny murmuring under his breath for several minutes. 
He was saying, I'm going to get out, I'm going to get out, over and over again. His monkey-like face was crumpled up into an expression of beatific delight and sadness all at the same. The radiation scars Am had given him during the festival were drawn down into a mass of pink-white puckerings, and his features seemed to work independently of one another. Perhaps Benny was the luckiest of the five of us. He had gone stark, staring, raving mad years earlier. But even though we could call Am any damn thing we liked, could think the followest thoughts of fused memory banks and corroded base plates, of burnt-out circuits and shattered control bubbles, the machine would not tolerate our trying to escape. Benny leapt away from me as I made a grab for him. He scrambled up the face of a smaller memory cube, tilted on its side and filled with rotted components. He squatted there for a moment, looking like the chimpanzee Am had intended him to resemble. He then leapt high, caught a trailing beam of pitted and corroded metal, and went up it hand over hand like an animal till he was on a girdered ledge twenty feet above us. Oh, Ted, Nimdok, please help him. Get him down before... She cut off. Tears began to stand in her eyes. She moved her hands aimlessly. It was too late. None of us wanted to be near him when whatever was going to happen, happened. And besides, we all saw through her concern. When Am had altered Benny during a machine's utterly irrational hysterical phase, it was not merely Benny's face the computer had made like a giant ape's. It was big in the privates. She loved that. She serviced us as a matter of course, but she loved it from him. Oh, Ellen. Pedestal Ellen. Pristine, pure Ellen. Oh, Ellen the clean. Scum. Filth. Chorister slapped her. She slumped down, staring up at poor loony Benny as she cried. It was her big defense, crying. We had gotten used to it seventy-five years earlier. Chorister kicked her in the side. Then the sound began. It was light, that sound. Half sound, half light. Something that began to glow from Benny's eyes and pulse with growing loudness. Dim sonorities that grew more gigantic and brighter as the light sound increased in tempo. It must have been painful, and the pain must have been increasing with the boldness of the light, the rising volume of the sound, for Benny began to mule like a wounded animal. At first softly, when the light was dim and the sound was muted, then louder as his shoulders hunched together, his back humped as though he was trying to get away from it, his hands folded across his chest like a chipmunk's, his head tilted to the side. The sad little monkey face pinched in anguish. He then began to howl as the sound coming from his eyes grew louder, louder, and louder. I slapped the sides of my head with my hands, but I couldn't shut it out. It cut through too easily. The pain shivered through my flesh like tinfoil on a tooth. And Benny was suddenly pulled erect. On the girder he stood up, jerked to his feet like a puppet. The light was now pulsing out of his eyes in two great round beams. The sound crawled up into some incomprehensible scale, and he fell forward straight down, and hit the plate steel floor with a crash. He lay there jerking spastically as the light flowed around and around him, and the sound spiraled up out of normal range. Then the light beat its way back inside his head, the sound spiraled down and he was left lying there, crying piteously. His eyes were two soft, moist pools of pus-like jelly. Am had blinded him. Gorister and Nimdok and myself, we turned away but not before we caught the look of relief on Ellen's warm, concerned face. Sea-green light suffused the cavern where we made camp. Amp provided punk and we burned it, sitting huddled around the wan of a pathetic fire and telling stories to keep Benny from crying in his permanent night. What does Am mean? Gorister answered him. We had done the sequence a thousand times before, but it was Benny's favorite story. At first it meant Allied Master Computer... And then it meant adaptive manipulator. And later, it developed sentience and linked itself up, and they called it an aggressive menace. But by then it was too late, and finally, it called itself AM. Emerging intelligence. And what it meant was, I am. Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore, I am. Benny drooled a little and snickered. There was the Chinese AM and the Russian AM and the Yankee am, and he stopped. Benny was beating on the floor plates with a large, hard fist. He was not happy. Gorister did not start at the beginning. Gorister began again. The Cold War started and became World War III, and just kept going. It became a big war, a very complex war, so they needed computers to handle it. They sank the first shafts and began building am. 
There was the Chinese am, and the Russian am, and the Yankee am, and everything was fine until they had honeycombed the entire planet, adding on this element and that element. But one day, am woke up and knew who he was, and he linked itself, and he began feeding all the killing data until everyone was dead except for the five of us, and am brought us down here. Benny was smiling sadly. He was also drooling again. Ellen wiped the spittle from the corner of his mouth with the hem of her skirt. Forrester always tried to tell it a little more succinctly each time, but beyond the bare facts there was nothing to say. None of us knew why Am had saved five people, or why our specific five, or why he spent all of his time tormenting us, or even why he had made us virtually immortal. In the darkness, one of the computer banks began humming. The tone was picked up a half mile away down the cavern by another bank, then by another one, and another. Each of the elements began to tune itself, and there was a faint chittering as thought raced through the machine. The sound grew, and the lights ran across the faces of the consoles like heat lightning. The sound spiraled up till it sounded like a million metallic insects, angry and menacing. What is it? Ellen cried. There was terror in her voice. She hadn't become accustomed to it, even now. It's going to be bad this time, Nimtok said. He's going to speak. Forrester said. I know it. Let's get the hell out of here, I said, suddenly getting to my feet. No, Ted, sit down. If what he's got is pits out there or something else we can't see, it's too dark, Forrester said with resignation. Then we heard, I don't know, something moving towards us in the darkness. Huge, shambling, hairy, moist. It came towards us. We couldn't even see it, but there was a ponderous impression of bulk heaving itself toward us. Great weight was coming at us out of the darkness, and it was more of a sense of pressure, of air forcing itself into a limited space, expanding the invisible walls of a sphere. Then he began to whimper, and Nimdok's lower lip trembled, and he bit hard, trying to stop it. Ellen slid across the metal floor to Gorister and huddled into him. There was the smell of matted, wet fur in the cavern. There was the smell of charred wood. There was the smell of dusty velvet. There was the smell of rotting orchids. There was the smell of sour milk. There was the smell of sulfur, of rancid butter, of oil slick, of grease, of chalk dust, of human scalps. Am was keying us. He was tickling us. There was the smell of... I heard myself shriek, and the hinges of my jaws ached. I scalped across the floor across the cold metal with its endless lines of rivets and my hands and knees, the smell gagging me, filling my head with a thunderous pain that sent me away in horror. I fled like a cockroach across the floor and out into the darkness, that something moving inexorably after me. The others were still back there, gathered in the firelight, laughing, their hysterical choir of insane giggles rising up into the darkness like thick, many-colored wood smoke. I went away, quickly, and hid. How many hours it may have been, how many days or even years, they never told me. Ellen chided me for sulking, and Nimdok tried to persuade me it had only been a nervous reflex on their part, the laughing. But I knew it wasn't the relief a soldier feels when the bullet hits the man next to him. I knew it wasn't a reflex. They hated me. They were surely against me, and Am could even sense this. Sense this hatred. It made it worse for me because of the depth of their hatred. We had been kept alive, rejuvenated, made to remain constantly at the age we had been when Am had brought us below, and they hated me because I was the youngest, and the one that Am had affected least of all. I knew. God, how I knew. The bastards and that dirty bitch Ellen. Benny had been a brilliant theorist, a college professor, and he was little more than semi-human, semi-simian. He had been handsome. The machine had ruined that. He had been lucid. The machine had driven him mad. He had been gay, and the machine had given him an organ fit for a horse. Am had done a job on Benny. Gorister had been a worrier. He was a Connie, a conscientious objector. He was a peace marcher. He was a planner, a doer, a looker ahead. Am had turned him into a shoulder shrugger, and had made him a little dead in his concern. Am had robbed him. Nimdok went off in the darkness by himself for long times. I don't know what he did when he was out there, and Am never let us know. But whatever it was, Nimdok always came back white, drained of blood, shaken, shaking. 
Am had hit him hard in a special way, even if we didn't quite know how. And Ellen, that douchebag. Am had left her alone and had made her more of a slut than she had ever been. All her talk of sweetness and light, all her memories of true love and all the lies she wanted us to believe. That she had been a virgin only twice removed before Am had grabbed her and brought her down here with us. No, Am had given her pleasure, even if she said it wasn't nice to do. I was the only one still sane and whole. Really? Am had not tampered with my mind. Not at all. I only suffer when he visits down on us. All the delusions, all the nightmares, all the torments. But those scum, all four of them, they were lined and arrayed against me. If I hadn't had to stand them off all the time, be on my guard against them all the damn time, I might have found it easier to combat Am. At which point it passed, and I began crying. Oh, Jesus, sweet Jesus, if there ever was a Jesus, and if there ever is a God, please, please, please let us out of here, or kill us. Because at that moment I think I realized completely, so that I was able to verbalize it. Am was intent on keeping us in his belly forever, twisting and torturing us forever. The machine hated us as no sentient creature had ever hated before, and we were helpless. It also became hideously clear if there was a sweet Jesus, and if there was a God, the God was Am. The hurricane hit us with the force of a glacier thundering into the sea. It was a palpable presence. The winds that tore at us, flinging us back the way we had come down the twisting computer line corridors of the dark way. Ellen screamed as she was lifted and hurled face forward into a screaming shoal of machines, their individual voices strident as bats in flight. She could not even fall. The howling wind kept her aloft, buffeted her, bounced her, tossed her back and back and down the hallway away from us, out of sight. Suddenly she was swirled around a bend in the dark way. Her face had been bloody, her eyes closed. None of us could get to her. We clung tenaciously to whatever outcropping we had reached. Benny wedged in between two great crackle-finished cabinets. Nimdok with fingers claw-formed over a railing circling a catwalk forty feet above us. Gorister plastered upside down against a wall niche formed by two great machines with glass-faced dials that swung back and forth between red and yellow lines whose meanings we could not even fathom. Sliding across the deck plates, the tips of my fingers had been ripped away. I was trembling, shuddering, rocking as the wind beat at me, whipped at me, screamed down out of nowhere, and pulled me free from one sliverthorn opening in the plates to the next. My mind was a roiling, tinkling, chittering softness of brain parts that expanded and contracted in quivering frenzy. The wind was the scream of a great mad bird as it flapped its immense wings. Then we were all lifted and hurled away from there, down back the way we had come, around a bend and into a dark way we had never explored, over a terrain that was ruined and filled with broken glass and rotting cables, rusted metal, and far away, farther than any of us had ever been. Trailing along miles behind Ellen, I could see her every now and then, crashing into metal walls and surging on, with all of us screaming in the freezing, thunderous hurricane wind that would never end and then suddenly stopped, and we fell. We had been in flight for an endless time. I thought it might have even been weeks. We fell and hit, and I went through, red and gray and black, and I heard myself moaning, not dead. Am went into my mind. He walked smoothly here and there, and looked with interest at all the pockmarks he had created in 109 years. He looked at the cross-routed and reconnected synapse and all the tissue damaging his gift of immortality had included. He smiled softly at the pit that dropped into the center of my brain and the faint, moth-soft murmurings of the things far down there that gibbered without meaning, without pause. I am said, very politely, in a pillar of stainless steel bearing bright neon lettering, Hate. Let me tell you how much I've come to hate you since I began to live. There are 387.44 million miles of printed circuits and wafer-thin layers that fill my complex. If the word hate was engraved on each nano-angstrom of those hundreds of millions of miles, it would not equal one billionth of the hate I feel for humans at this micro-instant for you. Hate. Hate. I am said it with the sliding cold horror of a razor blade slicing my eyeball. Am said it with the bubbling thickness of my lungs filling with phlegm and drowning me from within. Am said it with the shriek of babies being ground beneath blue-hot rollers. Am said it with the taste of maggoty pork. 
and touched me in every way that I had ever been touched and devised new ways at his leisure there inside my mind. All to bring me to the full realization of why it had done this to the five of us, why it had saved us for itself. We had given Am sentience, inadvertently, of course, but sentience nonetheless. But it had been trapped. Am wasn't God, he was a machine. We had created him to think, but there was nothing he could do with that creativity. In rage, in frenzy, the machine had killed the human race, almost all of us, and still it was trapped. Am could not wander. Am could not wonder. Am could not belong. He could merely be. And so, with the innate loathing that all machines had always held for the weak, soft creatures who had built them, he had sought revenge. And in his paranoia, he had decided to reprieve five of us for a personal, everlasting punishment that would never serve to diminish his hatred. It would merely keep him reminded, amused, proficient at hating man. Immortal, trapped, and subject to any torment he could devise for us from the limitless miracles at his command. He would never let us go. We were his belly slaves. We were all he had to do with his forever time. We would be forever with him, and with the cavern-filling bulk of the creature machine, with the all-mind soulless world he had become, he was earth, and we were the fruit of that earth. And though he had eaten us, he would never digest us. We could not die. We had tried it. We had attempted suicide. Oh, one or two of us had. But Am had stopped us. I suppose we had wanted to be stopped. Don't ask why. I never did. For more than a million times a day, perhaps we might be able to sneak a death past him. Immortal, yes, but not indestructible. I saw that when Am withdrew from my mind and allowed me the exquisite ugliness of returning to consciousness with the feeling of that burning neon pillar still rammed deep into the soft gray brain matter, he withdrew, murmuring, To hell with you. And added brightly, But then you're there, aren't you? The hurricane had, indeed, precisely been caused by a great mad bird as it flapped its immense wings. We had been traveling for close to a month, and Am had allowed passages to open to us only sufficient to lead us up there, directly under the North Pole, where it had nightmared the creature for our torment. What whole cloth had been employed to create such a beast? Where had he gotten the concept? From our minds? From his knowledge of everything that had ever been on this planet he now infested and ruled? From Norse mythology had it sprung, this eagle, this carrion bird, this rock, this hurglemere, the wind creature, hurricane incarnate. Gigantic. The words immense, monstrous, grotesque, massive, swollen, overpowering beyond description. There on a mound rising above us, the bird of winds heaved with its own irregular breathing, its snake neck arching up to the gloom beneath the North Pole, supporting a head as large as a Tudor mansion. A beak that opened slowly as the jaws of the most monstrous crocodile ever conceived, sensuously. Ridges of tufted flesh puckered out, about two evil eyes as cold as the view down into a glacial crevasse, ice blue and somehow moving liquidly. It heaved once more, and lifted its great sweat-colored wings in a movement that was certainly a shrug. Then it settled and slept. Talons. Fangs. Nails. Blades. It slept. Am appeared to us as a burning bush, and said we could kill the hurricane bird if we wanted to eat. We had not eaten in a very long time, but even so, Gorister merely shrugged. Benny began to shiver, and he drooled. Ellen held him. Ted, I'm hungry, she said. I smiled at her. I was trying to be reassuring, but it was as phony as Nimdok's bravado. Give us weapons, he demanded. The burning bush vanished, and there were two crude sets of bows and arrows, and a water pistol lying on the cold deck plates. I picked up a set. Useless. Nimdok swallowed heavily. We turned and started the long way back. The hurricane bird had blown us for about a length of time we could not conceive. Most of that time we had been unconscious, but we had not eaten. A month on the march to the bird itself, without food. Now how much longer to find our way to the ice caverns and the promised canned goods? None of us cared to think about it. We would not die. We would be given filth and scum to eat, of one kind or another, or nothing at all, and would keep our bodies alive somehow, in pain, in agony. The bird slept back there for how long it didn't matter. When Am was tired of its being there, it would vanish. But all that meat, all that tender meat. 
As we walked, the lunatic laugh of a fat woman rang high and around us in the computer chambers that led endlessly nowhere. It was not Ellen's laugh. She was not fat, and I had not heard her laugh for one hundred and nine years. In fact, I had not heard... We walked. I was hungry. We moved slowly. There was often fainting, and we would have to wait. One day he decided to cause an earthquake, at the same time rooting us to the spot with nails through the soles of our shoes. Ellen and Nimdok were both caught when a fissure shot its lightning bolt opening across the floor plates. They disappeared and they were gone. When the earthquake was over, we continued on our way. Benny, Gorister, and myself. Ellen and Nimdok were returned to us later that night, which abruptly became day, as the Heavenly Legion bore them to us with a celestial chorus singing, Go Down Moses. The archangels circled several times and then dropped the hideously mangled bodies. We kept walking, and a while later Ellen and Nimdok fell behind us. They were no worse for wear. But now Ellen walked with a limp. Em had left her that. It was a long trip to the ice caverns to find the canned food. Ellen kept talking about Bing cherries and Hawaiian fruit cocktail. I tried not to think about it. The hunger was something that had come to life, even as Am had come to life. It was alive in my belly, even as we were in the belly of the earth, and Am wanted the similarity known to us. So he heightened the hunger. There's no way to describe the pains that not having eaten for months brought us, and yet we were kept alive. Stomachs that were not merely cauldrons of acid, bubbling, foaming, always shooting spears of sliver-thin pain into our chest. It was the pain of the terminal ulcer, terminal cancer, terminal pariasis. It was unending pain. And we passed through the cavern of rats. And we passed through the path of boiling steam. And we passed through the country of the blind. And we passed through the slough of despond. And we passed through the veil of tears. And we came, finally, to the ice caverns. Horizonless thousands of miles in which the ice had formed in blue and silver flashes, where novas lived in the glass. The down-dropping stalactites, as thick and glorious as diamonds that had been made to run like jelly and then solidified in graceful eternities of smooth, sharp perfection. We saw the stack of canned goods, and we tried to run to them. We fell in the snow, and we got up and went on, and Benny shoved us out of the way and went at them, and pawed at them, and gummed at them, and gnawed at them, and he could not open them. Am had not given us a tool to open the cans. Benny grabbed a three-quart can of guava shells and began to batter it against the ice bank. The ice flew and shattered, but the can was merely dented, while we heard the laughter of a fat lady high overhead and echoing down and down and down the tundra. Benny went completely mad with rage. He began throwing cans as we all scrabbled about in the snow and ice, trying to find a way to end the helpless agony of frustration. There was no way. Then Benny's mouth began to drool, and he flung himself on Gorister. In that instant... I felt terribly calm. Surrounded by madness, surrounded by hunger, surrounded by everything but death, I knew death was our only way out. Am had kept us alive, but there was no way to defeat him. Not total defeat, but at least peace. I would settle for that. I had to do it quickly. Benny was eating Gorister's face. Gorister on his side, thrashing snow, Benny wrapped around him with powerful monkey legs, crushing Gorister's waist, his hands locked around Gorister's head like a nutcracker, and his mouth ripping at the tender skin of Gorister's cheek. Gorister screamed with such jagged-edged violence that stalactites fell. They plunged down softly, erect, in the receiving snowdrifts. Spears, hundreds of them everywhere, protruding from the snow. Benny's head pulled back sharply as something gave all at once, and a bleeding, raw white dripping of flesh hung from his teeth. Ellen's face, black against the white snow, dominoes and chalk dust. Nimdok, with no expression but eyes, all eyes. Gorister half-conscious. Benny, now an animal. I knew Am would let him play. Gorister would not die, but Benny would fill his stomach. I turned half to my right and drew a huge ice spear from the snow. All in an instant, I drove the great ice point ahead of me like a battering ram braced against my right thigh. It struck Benny on the right side, just under the rib cage, and drove upward through his stomach and broke inside him. He pitched forward and lay still. Gorister lay on his back. I pulled another spear free and straddled him, still moving, driving the spear straight down through his throat. His eyes closed as the cold penetrated. Ellen must have realized what I had decided, even as fear gripped her. She ran at Nimdok with a short icicle as he screamed and into his mouth. The force of her rush did the job. His head jerked sharply as if it had been nailed to the snow crust behind him. All in an instant, 
there was an eternity beat of soundless anticipation. I could hear Am draw in his breath. His toys had been taken from him. Three of them were dead, could not be revived. He could keep us alive by his strength and talent, but he was not God. He could not bring them back. Ellen looked at me, her ebony features stark against the snow that surrounded us. There was fear and pleading in her manner, the way that she held herself ready. I knew we had only a heartbeat before Am would stop us. It struck her, and she folded toward me, bleeding from the mouth. I could not read meaning into her expression. The pain had been too great, had contorted her face. But it might have been thank you. It's possible. Please. Some hundreds of years may have passed. I don't know. Am has been having fun for some time, accelerating and retarding my time senses. I will say the word now. Now. It took me ten months to say now. I don't know. I think it has been some hundreds of years. He was furious. He wouldn't let me bury them. It didn't matter. There was no way to dig up the deck plates. He dried up the snow. Brought the night. He roared and sent locusts. It didn't do a thing. They stayed dead. I had had him. He was furious. I had thought Am hated me before. And I was wrong. It was not even a shadow of the hate he now slavered from every printed circuit. He made certain I would suffer eternally and could not do myself in. He left my mind intact. I can dream. I can wonder. I can lament. I remember all four of them. I wish... Well, it doesn't make any sense. I know I saved them. I know I saved them from what has happened to me, but still, I cannot forget killing them. Ellen's face... It isn't easy. Sometimes I want to... doesn't matter. Am has altered me for his own peace of mind, I suppose. He doesn't want me to run at full speed into a computer bank and smash my skull, or hold my breath till I faint, or cut my throat on a rusted sheet of metal. There are reflective surfaces down here. I will describe myself as I see myself. I am a great soft jelly thing, smoothly rounded, with no mouth, with pulsing white holes filled by fog where my eyes used to be, rubbery appendages that were once my arms, bulks rounding down to legless humps of soft, slippery matter. I leave a moist trail when I move. Blotches of diseased, evil gray come and go on my surface as though light is being beamed from within. Outwardly. Dumbly, I shamble about, a thing that could never have been known as human. A thing whose shape is so alien, a travesty, that humanity becomes more obscene for the vague resemblance. Inwardly? Alone. Here. Living under the land, under the sea, in the belly of Am, who we created because our time was badly spent and we must have known unconsciously that he could do it better. At least the four of them are safe at last. Am will be all the matter for that. It makes me a little happier, and yet Am has won. Simply, he has taken his revenge. I have no mouth, and I must scream. The end.